Make sure you're subscribed to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. Type The Word of the Lord Endures Forever in your podcast provider. Hit that subscribe button and leave us a five-star review. This will make it easier for other podcast listeners to find The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. That tells us a bit about what Paul's detractors in the Galatian churches were intimating concerning him. Oh, Paul, well, you know, he's not really a top-grade apostle. He isn't one of the twelve, after all. I'm sure he means well, but let us give you the real scoop, straight from St. James and the others. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Galatians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. Last time we wrapped our trip up through Habakkuk with the closing words of his beautiful psalm or canticle. Remember how he had foreseen absolute economic collapse, the fruit-bearing trees and vines all chopped down and destroyed, So no figs, no grapes, no olives, no olive oil. This was the sort of scorched earth policy which Yahweh had specifically prohibited for his people, but the Babylonians would bow to no such strictures. That's why earlier he had decried the violence that the Babylonians would do to the earth. Check out chapter 2, verse 8. Not only did they destroy the fruit-bearing trees and vines, But they also burned the fields so that no crops could be harvested. And, of course, they looted all the livestock of the Israelites. All that were left were empty sheepfolds and cattle stalls. And in the face of such dire times, the prophet speaks faith's great nevertheless. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He knows and believes the promise of God's coming Savior. He has seen his approach and the defeat of all the enemies of God's people. And so instead of despairing and giving up, he's filled with joy in the God who effects salvation, the God who is his strength. Through the gift of faith from the word of God, Habakkuk's feet have been set up on the mountain heights. He can look over the history that's close at hand and from that high vantage point glimpse the future that is surely coming through the Lord's anointed. This vision of what awaits fills the prophet with great joy and inspires his song. Remember also the musical note at the end that this was written for the choir master and to be accompanied by strings. It was not Habakkuk's personal prayer, but was a prayer that all the faithful are invited to learn to sing as they wait together for the fulfillment of God's sure and certain promises. Now, we move back into the New Testament and to a book where the words of Habakkuk will play a key role in unpacking the uniqueness of the gospel, Galatians. 20th century Lutheran scholar and poet Martin Franzman believes the letter was written about A.D. 48 or 49. The Lutheran Study Bible places it a few years later, about A.D. 51 to 53, the disparity in dating is occasioned by the question of whether the Jerusalem Council, see Acts 15, has already taken place or is about to take place when Paul wrote the letter. Franzman's dating makes the greater sense to me, since if Paul had written Galatians after the council, he would surely have made use of its decision and mentioned it in his letter. So that's what I'm going to run with in my exposition of the book. We should note before we start that the 16th century reformer, Martin Luther, was so enamored of this book that he referred to it once as 
my Katie Von Bura. He loved it like he loved his own wife. He lectured through the book twice, and by comparing his two commentaries, you can trace the growth of his theological insight. The second commentary, the one published in 1535, is so highly regarded in the Lutheran Church that the formula of Concord simply says, if anybody regard anything more as necessary by way of a detailed explanation of this high and important article of justification before God on which the salvation of our souls depends, we direct him for the sake of brevity to Dr. Luther's beautiful and splendid exposition of St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians. We will be using Luther's work quite a bit in unpacking this book, but we'll also reap the numerous stunning insights that 4th century father St. John Chrysostom, above all, provided in his sermons on this letter. And with that long intro, let's get to the book itself. A reading from Galatians, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Galatians 1, verses 1 to 5. Let us pray. Grant, we beg you, Almighty God, to us and to your whole church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but have recourse and be preached and taught to the joy and the edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you and, in the confession of your name, abide to our end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to meditate on the words of today's passage? Let's dig into them. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Verse 2. And all the brothers who are with me. Which is to say, Paul comes out swinging in his introduction. He is at pains to make clear that he is an authentic apostle and he has handed on to them an authentic gospel. That tells us a bit about what Paul's detractors in the Galatian churches were intimating concerning him. Oh, Paul, well, you know, he's not really a top-grade apostle. He isn't one of the twelve, after all. I'm sure he means well, but let us give you the real scoop, straight from St. James and the others. To Paul, that didn't constitute an attack on his person, per se. That was an attack on the embassy he'd been entrusted with by none other than Jesus Christ and from his heavenly Father, who had raised him from the dead. Such an attack on the gospel leaves Paul, as we'd say, a bit hot under the collar. His temper is short throughout this whole epistle because the matter he was confronting was so urgent. Thus, he doesn't even include the usual niceties about his co-workers in naming them out. Rather, he just refers to all the brothers who are with me. Well, we can probably supply the names Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manan, the group that we met in Acts 13, verse 1 and following, who sent Paul and Barnabas off on the voyage that would bring these Christians in Galatia the gospel. It seems he and Barnabas had no sooner returned and reported how things went than word reached him that the same group who showed up in Syrian Antioch at this time, insisting on circumcision for salvation, were also spreading their message where Paul had just labored. He was beyond angered. Verse 2 continues. To the churches of Galatia. The next question we have to tackle is exactly who are these Galatians? The word Galatia, of course, is not the name of a single city, but of an entire province of the Roman Empire, stretching across Central Asia Minor, today's Turkey. According to Acts, 
Paul and Barnabas had brought the gospel to various cities of this region sometime around A.D. 47, beginning with Pisidian Antioch and then moving on to Iconium, Derby, and Lystra. It was to the Christians of these early churches, overwhelmingly Gentile in makeup, that the letter of Galatians was addressed. Apparently, not too long after Paul and Barnabas had planted the seed of the gospel there, Judaizing Christians had appeared in those places, insisting that these Gentiles could indeed be welcomed into the church, provided they accept circumcision and observe the kosher laws, and so on. The occasion of the letter was Paul's catching wind of what had happened in these places he just left. He writes the letter to set the matter straight for them. If we run with Bronzman's dating of the letter, this would be just prior to Paul and Barnabas heading up to Jerusalem to set the matter before the apostles. After the council, Paul immediately proposes a return visit. Though Paul and Barnabas split up over the disagreement about John Mark, Paul did indeed head right back to Derby and surrounding areas. Acts 16, verse 4. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. The substance of the letter, then, is addressed to the question of what is to be required of Christians, and particularly of Gentiles who come to the faith. Thus, the council's decision is the bona fides of the letter to the Galatians. But that's jumping the gun a bit. For now, we just want to understand who these Galatians are. Verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, verse 5, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is one of the shortest starts to any of Paul's epistles, yet brief and clipped as it is, it still gives us rich gospel. Luther wrote here, These two words, grace and peace, contain a summary of all of Christianity. Grace contains the forgiveness of sins, a joyful peace, and a quiet conscience. But peace is impossible unless sin has first been forgiven, for the law accuses and terrifies the conscience on account of sin, and the sin that the conscience feels cannot be removed by pilgrimages, vigils, labors, efforts, vows, or any other works. In fact, sin is increased by works. The more we work and sweat to extricate ourselves from sin, the worse off we are. For there is no way to remove sin except by grace. This deserves careful notice. For the words are easy, but in temptation it is the hardest thing possible to be surely persuaded in our hearts that we have the forgiveness of sins and peace with God by grace alone, entirely apart from any other means in heaven or on earth. And what joy to know that when Jesus gave himself into the flesh and then onto the cross and into death, this was to deliver us from this present evil age and was done according to the will of our God and Father. Luther again. Paul chooses and arranges his every word here in such a way that each of them does battle against the perverters of the doctrine of justification. Christ, he says, has delivered us from the wicked kingdom of the devil and the world and has done so according to the will, good pleasure, and command of the Father. Therefore, we have not been delivered by our own will or exertion or by our own wisdom or decision. We have been delivered because God has had mercy on us and has loved us. And St. John Chrysostom reads the text in a quite similar way. For he writes, For our sins, says the apostle, we had pierced ourselves with 10,000 evils and had deserved the gravest punishment. And the law not only did not deliver us, but it even condemned us, making sin more manifest without the power to release us from it or to stay the anger of God. But the Son of God made this impossibility possible 
for he remitted our sins. He restored us from enmity to the condition of friends. He freely bestowed on us numberless other benefits. And with St. John Chrysostom's joyous preaching of the text ringing in our ears, we'll call our halt for today. Next, with the niceties out of the way, the apostle will let the Galatians have it. He expresses his utter shock that they're turning away so quickly from the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is actually no gospel, no good news at all. Paul says that even if they themselves showed up with a different gospel or an angel from heaven tried to preach a different gospel, they're to be condemned. Does it sound, Paul asks, like I'm trying to be a people pleaser? That must have been what the Judaizers were implying. He didn't preach circumcision in order to curry favor with the people. He bluntly states that if he were trying to please men, he wouldn't be a servant of Christ at all. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.